Hey, welcome back, everybody. HSC Podcast 69. Got Big Box Steve on the mic. Big Smooth, Derek, and Fresh Wes. The whole crew tonight. Uh, if you didn't catch the last podcast, it's a good one. Check it out. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe and like. Leave a comment. Uh, doing a, a top five tonight by request from one of our viewers. So if you have top five requests... Uh, we'll get into those for you. And uh, if you're listening on Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, Anchor, thanks for listening. Appreciate the, the listens and any uh, comments. And I haven't checked poll results from last week, uh, but I'll, I'll start doing that and updating on future podcasts as we go. All right. Well, good, good podcast this week as well. Uh, I got to tell you, that's pretty tough top fives that we are doing this week. I had a hard time with these ones. Uh, so they're, they're ones that you look at when you talk about like the best of all, you know, it's like the best of the best. It's real hard when you start trying to narrow down lists, you know, of your, of your top, like, who do I take off? What do I take off? Like, it's really, it was really tough. So uh, first of all, though, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, what we were mentioning earlier is, Obviously, you know, being from the area, we want to talk a little bit about, you know, Damian Lillard, what's going on out here with the Trailblazers. Uh, you, you know, if you haven't heard, obviously, uh, the big news was he requested a trade. It was kind of interesting, though, before we get in more in depth than that, he was talking about wanting to be traded before. And then he goes in, he's like, I want to be a Blazer. And now he's requesting a trade again, mm -hmm. you know, all within a matter of months. So what's going on with him? Like, what's why? What why the flips? Like, what's what's going on in his head? If you had to, if we have to guess. Mm -hmm. we, obviously, we don't know, but if we're guessing what's going on in Damien's head, like, what's happening? Well, well, well go ahead, Wes. Um, the rumor is that when they shut him down with a few games left. He thought that at first he thought, you know, we have a chance to get the plan. We can win the plan and make the playoffs. And they kind of shut him down prematurely. And I think that kind of started the whole, like, you know what? He he just, after that, I think he might have had a change of heart. And then like maybe they, they didn't want to win or they didn't want to take their shot at the playoffs. They, they just, to they didn't win. want it because they, 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 they pretty much knew, you know, we're going to trade him. They kind of assumed that. And so I think Lillard's like, oh, well, that's kind of like, I mean, that's how you view the situation. You you don't want me to get hurt. You don't want to make the playoffs because you think I'm going to get hurt and then you can't, and I have no value and all this stuff. I, It was just a weird situation. I got more of that. He saw the Heat make the finals and now he's turned his attention to going opposite of what he said his whole career and now he just wants to go and it's like oh the heat i'll go win a championship with the heat right and then like, he waits he yeah you didn't hear this that's the only team he wants to play for yeah his yeah agent so came out and told other teams <sighs> don't trade for him he only wants to go to the heat i mean kind of signs a, sounds a lot like a clyde drexler situation right Right, you know, this is a guy we we thought would retire a blazer, but what he at the end of the day he wanted that championship, and he knew he could get it in Houston. Right, you know, so he goes there. Uh, the, so the problem is, is you know, why wait till after the draft? Why wait till after yeah. free agency started? I, I think he also. So I think the flip flop happened because. So is my opinion is I think he wanted traded. He came out and he said, you know, it's it's time to trade like after the end of last season because it was, you know, months before the draft where he expressed interest in being traded. And then he, he goes, they get the a top pick. And I think he was kind of like, well, wait a minute. Let's see what happens in the draft. And then after the draft, he's like, nope, that's not working for me, right? I, now I want to get traded. And again, that's speculation, but I, I feel like, what I think is going on his head at this point is what you just said, which is I'm, I'm he's coming up, you know, mid thirties and, and greater in the next few years. It's time. Like you're probably not going to win a championship in Portland. You know, it, it's, yeah. it, there's not, the outlook is not good. And it's not impossible. Like if he stayed 
and they had a good couple years. They could be contenders in three years, you know, but that's a long time. And that gets him into a, an age where injuries become prevalent. Like well, now he's not going to be the man and hurt. Right. It's going to be Scoot Henderson and Shaden Sharp and Damian right. Lord who's be on the team. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot, there's a lot to, to look there. Uh, as far as the Miami thing, obviously he sees the opportunity to win in Miami. Right. But also, I, I they're not his agents and him. They're not stupid. They know that Miami has the assets to make the trade. They have too. no assets, though. Well, they, well, with if they give up the picks, they're talking. I mean, I've seen some proposals that they've thrown out there. You're talking about like Tyler Hero, uh, Robinson. Uh, they had a third one on there. Who was the other one? Uh, so Hero Robinson. Another Jarvis decent or... young guy. Oh, the other guy they just drafted too. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right. So the yeah. guy they just drafted and They're then Jokic. three. Right. And Jokic. So him too. So there's four. <laughs> so they had Hero, Robinson, uh, Jokic, and uh what's that guy's name for UCL UCLA kid, right? Jamie Jarwes, wasn't it? Jarvis? Yeah, yeah. Jarvis. Yeah, Jarwes. So and then three picks. Yeah. yeah, but we're not talking, we're talking like 2027, 2029. Yeah. We're not talking right. anything in the that's but that's what the Blazers need. The Blazers are in rebuild. Like they're especially spec- if you trade Dame. If you trade Dame, you know you're not gonna win. Well, the Knicks got more for Przingis than that. Right. Yeah, and there's uh and so I mean it's back and forth I mean, a lot of different guys. Got, I mean the Jazz yeah. got more for Gobert and more from Donovan Mitchell than that, though. So I heard a couple. Uh, I was listening to a podcast and they were kind of comparing those previous trades, Gobert trade. They they even talked about Kevin Durant trade and um, what was the other? There was another one. Uh, but yeah, and then they're saying they're talking about how it's a different market. And to be honest with you, I'm not that into NBA to know all the ins and outs. But when they mentioned like the new CBA and you know, the, the the way the new market is working with salaries and things like that, that they you, you're not going to get as much for an aging dame as you could have three, even three years ago, four years ago, two years ago. Yeah, but the Heat are desperate. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, do you, how much do you want to give up for him, though? Sure. And I know, and I'm sorry, but does dame on the Heat make them the – number one team no i don't no. think so no. i think this year was a fluke for the heat yeah, <laughs> yeah, never anyway, know, um, never injuries. yeah. jason tatum was like why don't you come to the celtics so that's that's i i think and you know he's already said i don't want to go to the celtics but i think the celtics make sense also because you know of course you have you know, I mean, you have good players on the Heat, but Jason Tatum is a guy, the way he plays, he could play for a very long time at that level. And other guys on the Heat, they're going to order by, you know, you never know, he can get hurt. Um, Tatum, and you got Porzingis now. You add Dame, it makes, you know, of course, you're going to need some role players. You got to cover. They're going to have to give up. You got to cover a sixty million dollar contract too. And that means they lose Brown if they trade for Lillard. But they might lose. I mean, Brown might want out anyway. So it's. I think Boston is not a terrible idea either. The Sixers, but he he's already said, I just want to go to the Heat, and so everybody's hands are tied. And I've heard that they want to possibly do multi team trades. Because well, because I don't think the, the Blazers don't the want the Blazers yeah. don't want Hero. Why would they need? They don't need another. They don't want they. Yeah, I, I mean it's nice to have Hero in the package, but they want more. They want someone else. So because I mean they have Simons, they have Sharp, Scoot Henderson. Hero's not gonna. I mean, yeah, yeah, and you you also I so you gotta look at teams that have actually shown interest too. And according to you know what I've been reading, only the Clippers and the 
uh, 76ers even showed interest at all. No, and yeah. then, then there's the Celtics and the Jazz have showed interest. Now, now the Warriors popped up today. I think that's that's a smoke. I, I can't see him. Why, why would I mean? He- Everybody's was, gonna want Dame. Like nobody's not gonna want him. Yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> that was gonna do. That was Lillard said he would play for the Warriors, but that was before Chris yeah, Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah like, right. Obviously, no, no team's gonna be like, no, I don't want Dame. But the, there's a realistic part. Yeah, but if it, if you're talking the Sixers, then you're talking about Maxi. You know, right. you're getting Maxi or. Well, no, it's Harden. And it's right. not well, the Blazers getting Harden. No. But it would be like someone else getting Harden. Yeah, yeah. The, I think the Sixers is where you get into the three team yeah. move potentials. Yeah. And and I don't see how the Clippers cannot have that be a situation either. Like you, you kind of have to have that if you're the Clippers too. Like a right. three team. Well, right. because they picked up Westbrook, they picked Westbrook back up too. So right. it wouldn't right. make any sense. Right. Unless yeah, it's some right. type of three team deal, right? Where yeah. they're moving around. And so, what Harden though? Is he is he on player option or is he straight free agent? He was a player option, and he opted in. He opted in for them okay, to trade so, him. Right. So Harden's moving one way or another. Yes. But who yeah. wants to pick up? Who wants? I mean, no. <laughs> statistically, he's not terrible, though. I mean, statistically, he still puts up good numbers. And the 76ers really underwhelmingly played terrible in the playoffs. They well, they they they, 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 as... they they kind of they kind of shot themselves in the foot with the Celtics series, right. you know. And and but the thing about Harden is going to be a third wheel anywhere where where he goes. So the question is, is there are two guys when they need a third guy, and there's a few teams, but still, I mean, do you really want to just you know? carry that contract and and just he just plays so bad in big moments it's just he pl- i mean he just did not show up in the Celtics series yeah like if he would if he would at least showed up i think they win that series right he, he never showed show up, up ever in the playoffs so yeah he, he's always struggled in the so do you in really the want playoffs. to pick that up i you know the, people right. say he wants to go back to Houston yeah it's probably the best situation you know for him and you know I don't, yeah. I, I kind of agree with Derek on this one. I don't see why anybody would want Harden at this point. Because if you try to bring in a guy like that, what you're trying to do, you're trying to win a championship, right? Mm-hmm. Well, and you're going to pick up a guy who doesn't perform well in the playoffs. It's not going to help yeah. you in yeah. your championship run, you know? And so, like, I, I don't see a lot of value there uh, in Harden. So, I guess when you're, if you're the Blazers, here would be maybe the only other thing to think about was if you don't trade Dame, you keep him. Is that better having maybe potential not as good a performance as you you might get you might possibly get for him before versus trading him for a little bit less than you could actually get, you know? Well, I mean the the Nets did it last year with Durant, right? He requested yeah. a trade at the beginning of the year. <laughs> they didn't trade him till halfway through the season. He played. I mean, he wasn't disgruntled. I just don't think you can just say, Oh, I want to be traded to just one team take whatever they give you peace out right but if the deal is good maybe it's not like excellent right but maybe it's still good like is do do you consider that as the blazers for getting a good deal maybe like i said maybe not the best possible yeah. everybody wants the best possible deal right mm-hmm. that's obvious but maybe you're you're in a place where it's like man this is an actual good deal yeah i don't know i i think the thing comes down to what Danny Ainge did in Utah. I mean, what he did with Gobert, that's right, what right. every GM is going to be like, well, if that's like the best possible. I mean, you're talking about like the biggest trade rape ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like that's just it doesn't get any worse than that. <laughs> or at least something for like what uh they got for Donovan Mitchell. Yeah. I, I think I think still the Heat are in somewhat an advantage here because the the, the Blazers really want to eat this and say you know what oh we can't get a deal we can't get you the one team you want sorry you're just gonna have to stay with us yeah it really puts the Blazers in an awkward position because honestly obviously he doesn't want to be there 
but there is that small that small idea saying you know what if i'm not gonna if i'm not going to the team that i want then i might as well stay with the team that i want to be with as a second option and that's the blazers right right it's it's a weird it's just a weird scenario well, and the problem is is nowadays it's all player player empowerment and i'm going to team oh, with yeah. this guy you know what your players you're not gms you don't know s about team chemistry and putting yeah. together teams right. look, at, look at when the bulls were good jordan w- went to reinsdorf and um said hey i want these guys and they didn't said no we're not yeah, doing that. M- multiple times multiple look, times he did. they won six championships right look what jordan did when he became an owner yeah like the worst oh, look at lebron terrific. james like lebron james is a locust to every team he goes to because he comes in and he's like oh i want kevin love i want you know this okay we'll trade all our assets away yeah. 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 You're winning one the championship, team. then I'm gonna leave. At least they got a championship, though. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but that's all. Uh, yeah, it's because it, that's what the players want, right? And I don't think Dame's the kind of guy to to not play full on. You know, if he doesn't get traded, you know, he, he's still got to get his. He's still got to yeah. perform. But, he's becoming very Kevin Durantish. Very it, 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 butt it, hurt. He, He's oh. he is walking that fine line right now yeah. because it's like now I will say this that there was a lot of noise last couple of months about well he he doesn't want it bad enough he doesn't want to win bad enough he doesn't want to go to a team because he's not going to win in Portland I think that noise kind of got to him too he's like you know that he I think he feels the pressure of hey yeah of course I want to win I want to win a title but. I'm not all about winning a title. I'm not going to sit there and say, you know what? Hey, let's get three superstars on a team and win a title. He's not that yeah. type of guy. Well, but he is now. Point, people are saying, yeah. do you really want to win? You but know? he is now, you know, he he is now turning into that guy who's going to go to or try to go to some, you know, three-headed monster. Yeah, but he's, he's come out team. publicly in the last year and, and racked on people indirectly for doing yeah. that but then the media came back and said oh so well what do you how are you gonna win you're gonna win with portland no, right you're not well so i know paul george pressure. already came out and uh said huh seems like you're doing exactly what you said i did right yeah. <laughs> well yeah and that's because he has i mean was is right he has expressed that in the past and uh it, the other issue is like not everybody can play into their 40s you know and so he does have limited time. Like he he's getting up there. He, you know, he's not say he's no, old he's, because he's, he's, he's but he's, he's gonna he's got a lot of miles. And the thing is, he, I mean, I would already start. I mean, if I did, if I was Miami, I would also look at his minutes and say, okay, how do yeah. we limit this? Because he is thirty three, but a lot of miles at thirty three. Yeah. So well, that's and another he's a- problem too. He's small, the way he plays, it's a lot of going to the basket. It's a lot of getting hit and going to the ground. You know, that's a different type of of way to play, you know. Um, that puts a lot of pressure on your body. He can he he doesn't have to throw his body around there. Yeah. But at the same point, he's gonna feel the pressure to do that at some at at moments. Well, I think anything can happen. He'll turn into more of a a shooter, a jump shooter. You know, in the latter years, of course. That's why I'm sad because I thought him and Scoot would have worked really well together. Right, right. Well, and they still may because I think at this point, I think the Blazers, just like any team, they want to get max value. Right. You know. Well, and, that's the whole. Dame wanted to trade Scoot for like, like an okay player that's was a star when he was like 10 years old. You know know what I mean? That's the thing is it's like, Oh, let's trade the number two overall pick for Draymond green or something. Right. Right. Oh man, you're destroying. (laughs) Well, cause the Blazers obviously got to think about long-term, right? They got to think about their future. And why would you trade your number two overall pick or your, was it three overall, right? Was it three overall? Number three overall. Right. So they were talking then if this, if it wasn't, you know, <laughs> what's his um Victor Scoot would have would have been the number one pick. 
easily. Right. right? He was a once in a generation talent also, but you had the unicorn in this draft. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I, I think, I think that's uh that's why I said, you know, maybe the Blazers might look at pretty good trade, you know, but oh, and one other, so Brandon Miller in his first summer league game, six points, eight fouls. Jeez. Didn't he, <laughs> didn't he, didn't he have like four turnovers? To, like um, he did not play well. I saw some, is, uh, it, and it's just like enough noise about Brandon Miller. Right, I, I'm right. not impressed. Of course, he's going to be a good player, but man, if I had the number two pick and I could get some value for him, totally would have pulled the trigger on it. You know, is uh. <laughs> I thought I read something where Holmgren is Holmgren playing summer league games. Yeah, he's playing really well. I saw him. Yeah, yeah. He, he had ten. He had uh, I think he had ten points, eleven rebounds. But he had like saying he's going to be rookie of the year. He had, <laughs> yeah, he had a lot of turnovers. He turned yeah. the ball like seven times. Yeah, but if you watch summer league, it's like turnover fest. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, it's so. Weird. It's like it's like us playing down the park. <laughs> yeah, because they're just they're just trying to like, score points, and you know they're not doing. They're not trying to protect the ball. They're like, not running a whole bunch of offense. You know, it's it's, but it, it's sometimes fun to watch. Uh, so that'll I be interesting. One game. I'm just, I watched Charlotte their first game. I'm just like, man, they're bad. Like, geez, do you have any like? Yeah, and it really does make me scratch my head about doors. I'm like, what what have you done here? Like, what are you doing? Like, so the problem here is with the Dame situation. Is this? You might run into a Kevin Durant situation where this may not get resolved. If it does, you're you're halfway through the season, right? Well, that might be good. Maybe he starts playing with them and realizing, oh man, yeah. these guys have what it takes. Maybe in a year or so, we'll be right, right. Yeah, and so that's I think that's what's kind of bad about these type of situations where you start talking about it now, and you you now you got another you know. <laughs> seven months of talking about it right <laughs> well at least i think it's august 1st or august 3rd or something is when they could tr- trade jamie jarquez right right so, so you, you if that's a situation you got to make that decision by then but after that you're talking about trade deadline right yeah well i mean you can't trade for him until then so oh, yeah, yeah. so wait. you won't know right yeah yeah, so we'll uh we'll see what happens with this. I think that's uh it's an interesting probably one of the more interesting storylines in the NBA right now. Um but next year, we won't talk about this cuz we want to get on our next subject, but next year's free agency potential is pretty crazy too. So, uh we'll, everyone's going to want to know what LeBron's going to do. <laughs> well, where Bronny goes, right? Yep. <laughs> oh God. He's gonna really? play her opt out and, and try Bronny. to get traded, right? Or go to oh, free agents. Yeah. Well, you know. Bronny's gonna so, be like the hundredth ranked player and he's gonna go number one overall. Right, right. Because everybody's like they want LeBron going there. Oh, my and then God. LeBron will play like five games. Right. I like I said, I would already be sick of myself if I was LeBron. I like oh. everyone just stop talking every single day. <laughs> you guys gotta talk about. I'm sick of coming home and turn on my TV and there's LeBron. There's me. Wow. I, on, I blame dude. his I blame his fan base too. Yes, of that. course. It is it's nauseating. <laughs> it is. Well, and then I blame him for going to the Lakers because then it's like ESPN. That's all they want oh, to talk yeah. about. Right, right. Now you're in big market. Well, you're in well, how uh, great, big franchise. How great of an offseason the Lakers had. They re signed yeah. everyone back. It's like <laughs> how do the Lakers, you know, so last year was terrible because they weren't good. And it's like well. How did they, they get I, back on track? It's like, really? The Lakers kind of were like the Heat in the playoffs. Like, they played way above their potential. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, they had a chance. It's not like they didn't have a chance. Like, they were right yeah, there. They played the Nuggets. Yeah. Until the Nuggets <laughs> just put the kibosh on that. Yeah. Like, no, not happening. Yeah, I don't think they, the the, uh, they played a couple <laughs> of decent games. Nuggets. Yeah. They played a couple of decent games against the Nuggets, but not enough, obviously, no. that they would have won any type of long series. But all right, so we have two other good topics that we're going to get into tonight. Um, which one do you guys want to go first, or which which topic should we do? 
You want to start with the football teams? Let's let's start yeah. with. Uh, we'll yeah. start with the football team. Yeah, so we'll we'll stay with sports. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna jump into uh, college football because pretty soon we'll be talking college football. We'll be talking uh, NFL um, real soon here. We're gonna do our, our top five uh, college teams that have won the national championship. We're gonna rank them best teams ever to win the college national championship. Give you our top five here. Uh, this is a hard one because there's quite a few, I would say, honorable mentions if they, you left them out of your top five, and we'll see how they mix into each other's top fives. Uh, but like I said earlier, anytime you're talking about like trying to choose the best of the best, it, it gets real hard, you know, to get down to this top five. So um, I struggle a little bit with this one. It took me a while to to narrow some things down. So here we go, HSC podcast top five college football national champions uh let's see Derek why don't you lead us off <laughs> going with my homer pick the uh, number five is the 1996 Gators okay uh they they averaged 47 points per game that season Went over 57 times, beat five ranked teams, and beat number one and number two in the same season. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that, that's a good pick. Um, I think when I look at things like that, I look at similar things. I, I think strength to schedule, like who you beat matters a lot. You know, um, obviously scoring points is great, you know, but a lot of teams score a lot of points. I, I would say, though, when a team wins big games, you know that, and, and then wins the national championship. That puts you up there, right? Right. Well, so, they played uh, Florida State, who was ranked number one, and beat them fifty-two to twenty. Right. In the national so, championship game. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's a, a completely out of you know pocket pick. Nothing wrong with that because again, you you can look at other teams that you know other people would rank higher. Yet you know sometimes they didn't even play a, more than one top ten team. You know but they outscored their opponents by 40 points a game or whatever, you know? So, uh, so 96 Florida Gators, uh, who are their, who are their top players? Uh, well, Warfel won the uh, Heisman. And I can't remember. I wasn't, I think that was, um, I kill Anthony. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that was Warfel year. Got it. Yeah. Fred Taylor. So they had a good team. It's a real good team. Uh, at number five, uh, it's interesting because there's a lot of options for Alabama. Uh, so I have an Alabama team here. And I have a 2009 Alabama team. Pretty unique in – I think it's the first time Alabama beat teams that are actually, you know, at some point people thought were better than them. And that's what I liked about this season for them. They weren't like – going to be it didn't look like they dominated the world in this season uh and they played arguably one of the toughest schedules you know being in the sec obviously is tough anyway they beat some solid teams some high ranked teams but they had a good solid core you know five consensus all americans a lot of guys going to the nfl you know solidly beat a couple of the top ranked teams win the national championship uh and it was their second straight undefeated season you know or regular season anyway. So so it's a good way for, for them to get started. So I got 2009 Bama, number five. We got five, Wes. I got the uh, the 2020 LSU Tigers with Joe Burrow, Mr. Burrow, and Jamar Chase. I just put up a lot of points. Number one offense in the nation. Played Clemson, handled them pretty well. They could, they probably could have beat them worse than seventeen points, and Clemson was pretty stacked. So, yeah, but Clemson that Chase, I mean, that just, I mean, Burrow was just just throwing lasers the whole season. I mean, in that game, he had four hundred sixty three yards. You know, just oh just yeah, torched the. I mean, and and Clemson did not have a terrible defense, put it that way, and it was just a, just a. He just tore them apart. 
Right. And Clemson won the year before, right? 2018. Yeah. King Clemson won. They won. Yeah, they beat Alabama and they crushed Alabama. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a, it's a solid. Oh, wait a minute. Well, yeah. It's 2019. Yeah. Yeah. So you, yeah. They play in 2020, but they're the 2019 team. All right. Number four. uh, I got. So I did go back a little bit of time to grab this one. Uh, this is the 1971 Nebraska Cornhuskers. And you got, I mean, Johnny Rogers, number one, but you play in what's called the game of the century. You know, you're, you're beating that Oklahoma team, but you also beat the number two, number three, number four teams. You beat every other team that was ranked high in that season. Yeah. Uh, Colorado, uh, Oklahoma, and then Alabama. And you go undefeated at that time, winning the game of the century, winning those games, beating all the top teams. I don't think there was up to that point much decision on who is really one of the best national champion team up to the seventies. And so I had to throw that nostalgic Nebraska 71 in there. Did you see some of the highlights? Did you see Johnny Rogers on the, dude, on he's the, amazing the, dude on the punt return. He the, fumbled yeah. the ball and he picked it up and, that dude was fast. Mm-hmm. Like I couldn't believe how fast he was. I want to get his forty time. Like how fast <laughs> he ran. that. But but that run. I mean, man, he was fast. Yeah, he the was seventies. Johnny Rogers was something else. And uh, but that team, like I said, they just dominated the year. And so I got to give that to him. I got to put them in the top five because up to that point, yeah, I don't know that anybody had a better season than that. All right, Wes, number four. I got the 91 Miami Hurricanes. Uh, undefeated, pretty much handled everybody the whole year, beat up on Nebraska in the rain. They probably could have – they probably would have beat up on worse, but they decided, you know what, we're just going to run the ball, not with uh, Williams, but with uh, Pruitt. And, you know, they handled – they handled – I mean, Nebraska didn't score a point. Their defense was just ridiculously – yeah. Good. Um, yeah, so. Wes, you better have some bangers coming in your top three. Because <laughs> you have oh, some yeah. good, good top five teams here. Yeah. Uh, Wes, you got it for us. All well, right. There. There have, yes. The, this one's kind of a cheat because they won a national championship, but it got taken away. And that's the 2004 Trojans. Oh yeah, I mean, what what can you say? Should have won back to back championships, but yeah, <clears throat> they were stacked, and well, they could have had three in a row, right? They, they could have won the year before that. They, <laughs> then they dominated in two, 20, 2004, and then they barely right. lost in two thousand five. Yeah, that was they had a whole dynasty there, but only one championship, and it got taken right. away. Right, right. Yeah, which I don't worry about those type of things. No. Having this type of uh, top five. I mean, that, that's a great team. Yeah, and just dominate, dominated people. But hey, what what can you say about Reggie Bush, right? Matt Leinert. Throw, throw Leinert in there. But, yeah, that's a, that's a real good team there as well. <laughs> Let's see, number three. So three, we start. Wes, you're leading us off. What do you got at three? I got the 2012 Alabama Crimson Tide. Right there. Yeah. Um, just dominated Notre Dame in the Orange Bowl. I mean, Notre Dame shouldn't even showed up. It was just, and everyone's like hyping Notre Dame. Oh yeah, they got a chance. It's like <laughs> they were done in the first quarter. Like, they just could not stop. I mean, they just ran over them. They, they didn't even have to throw the ball. It's like they just couldn't stop them. So, but that team was pretty stacked. Right. Yeah, I mean, Alabama during that time period was was really killing people. And that whole, like, 2000, you know, they, they seemed like what the Patriots were doing. 
they were they were pretty unstoppable for a while. So that's a good, a nice number three there. Derek, what do you got at three? This is my the latest one almost. It is the 2021 Bulldogs, Georgia Bulldogs. I think that team was heads and shoulders above better than the team that won this last year. They averaged giving up 6.2 points a game. Yeah, their defense was solid. I mean, both those Georgia teams are really good, but yeah, I feel like I, they were the <clears throat> this last year though, you had receivers going down. You know, if Marvin Harrison Jr. doesn't get hurt, we might be looking at a different thing. Yeah, I think that's a, the the one questionable game you look at last year's Georgia's team season was that Ohio State game. Because boy, did they uh did they get lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're real lucky to win that game. Uh, so, yeah, Georgia definitely had uh, both Georgia teams. You know, I, I would be going my honorable mention. I didn't pick them in my top five, but I would say they're easily right there. I went for my number three. I got I had 2004 USC as well, uh, just because the dominant, that was the dominating season. You know, it's like. That was the time where they they really said, you know, we're we're not going to leave any any questions on the season. Like we're going to go out, we're going to dominate everybody, we're going to win the national championship, and we're going to prove that you know we're the best team. And that's what they did. They they went out and and just killed people, and they they were so dynamic. Was the problem with that team um, at a lot of different positions? So that's for me. That's a team that you don't want to play. Even, you know, when you think about like later, as people get more athletic and sometimes we think, you know, everybody says, oh, well, 1990s can never play with 2020s. I don't think anybody in the 2020s would want to play that 2004 USC team. <laughs> they were fast. They were good, you know, did everything well. So I, I got them at three. Uh, Wes, what do you got at three? As number three, um, yeah, um, USC two thousand four. Just, I mean, Matt Liner, Reggie Bush was unstoppable, and then, you know, Thunder and Lightning, Lindell White, Howard. I mean, I mean, it sucked because for teams like, oh yeah, we're just gonna key on Reggie Bush. Good luck stopping Lindell White. He was, I mean, he's underrated when he when he played there, and then. On the outside, Dwayne Jarrett just torched Oklahoma in the championship game. But they had yeah. no answer for it. And then they start rolling over on Jarrett. I was like, okay, I'll just throw it to Steve Smith. And he had a couple times. <laughs> I mean, they just they just beat. And then their defense was very underrated. Yeah. Just, but Pete Carroll ran that defense. I mean, he just he puts guys in positions to make plays. And he's just an unbelievable motivator. I, I mean, they – I, I've watched the Oklahoma game a few times. I mean, it's fun to watch because they just because like, <laughs> they're trying to hype Oklahoma. And White is such a great quarterback. Where is he now? Where did yeah. it ever happen to him? Like, it or just, what happened to Liner though? Yeah, <laughs> dude, he's on TV, man. <laughs> he's with Reggie Bush doing right. commercials. Liner played a little bit, not a whole lot though, right? <laughs> so Liner, Liner. Yeah, he kind of just fell into a hole there. <clears throat> Went to Arizona. That's what happened. Right. That'll happen. Yeah. That'll happen in Arizona. Uh, yeah, I mean, I could say we, I think we all got USC up there, that, that 2004 team. Uh, jump number two. And I don't – I can't see how, Wes, you had this team low as you did. This is where I have the 2001 Hurricanes. Uh, number one defense in the country, number three offense in the country, beating a lot of ranked teams, you know, uh, just dominating. But the biggest thing is you send 30 guys off that team to the NFL. 30. 17 of them as number one picks over the next few years. Yeah. And no, they're, they're on my they're, – they're, they're on my list. Yeah, you had yeah. him up there, but you know, I I got him at two just because I think you could put them at number one. You could argue for them at number one, 
Um, it, I I looked the at type the of dominating they did. It, yeah, I mean, of course, yeah. If we're talking about NFL talent, I mean, yeah, they they should be it should be like the top two. But I I watched them play Nebraska. You know, of course they win, but Nebraska was depleted. They got beat by Colorado. It was just they they shouldn't have been in that stupid game. Actually, Oregon should have been in that game. You know, that right. would have been a better matchup. But Oregon would have got beat, too. I mean, Miami's defense yeah. was – they showed Ed Reed had nine interceptions that yeah. season. Nine. He almost Ed, had ten double-digit interceptions in college football. I think uh, – didn't two DBs go before Ed Reed? Or was it just one? What I don't – in, in the next year's draft. I know I at remember. least the one of them went ahead of him. Yeah. Which is crazy. But I'm saying from Miami, not overall. From Miami, one, well, you had Sean Taylor, uh, yeah, and, and then so, Philip Buchanan, Philip Buchanan, and maybe even Mike Ralph, right? Was it Mike Ralph? Give me a second. What the fuck is that? Antron Roll. Well, some of those guys went later. Uh, later. In drafts, I just, so Ed Reed went the very next year after they won the championship. Okay, but yeah, at least one guy went ahead of him. What know, was that Reed drafted at? Like seventeen. Okay, well, Buchanan was after that because he went to the Raiders at like twenty or something. No, no, they the Raiders drafted Buchanan before Reed, dude. Oh well, yeah, Bu- Buchanan, yeah. Buchanan would went up so, so high. So maybe Reed went later, but Buchanan went before Reed to the Raiders. I remember that. Oh, 17. Yeah. Ed Reed was 24. 24, right. So Buchanan was 17. Yeah. So they took Buchanan before Rump Reed. Rump was 27. Um, so three of their DBs went in the first round the next year after they won that. Yeah, well, Rump, plus guys yeah, like Rump was the first round, yeah. Plus guys like Brian McKinney and you know uh, yeah, Ch- Jer- Jeremy Shockey. McKinney yeah, so they, went, yeah seven. And and then, I will say Dorsey, you know, was a good quarterback under that system. I mean, yeah, if because I, I was thinking about, you know, why wouldn't I take the eighty-eight Hurricanes? But Steve Walsh, Dorsey. <laughs> well, for, for me for me the reason I have my them so high and I think you have an argument for number one is because they dominate on offense and defense yeah so I got them at two so Wes what do you got at two I got 2021 Georgia just like 26 players drafted 14 on defense 11 on offense I mean, even their punter was drafted in the fourth round. Like, really? <laughs> like, and, and their defense, I mean, they just they just put the clamp down on teams. I mean, it was yeah. just all time, like, and you, you kind of scratch your head. like, how are they doing this? Well, it's because they have a lot of great players. Yeah. So. I mean, you, it's a, it was a good team, like a real good team. And good for years, too. Like, they built a solid – uh, a couple years there where they were uh, they were doing real well. Um, I'm not the biggest Stetson Bennett fan and Georgia fan, but their defense was killer. Um, I think you could put a lot of quarterbacks in there, oh, and they would have yeah. won. Stetson Bennett was like, he we don't know. <laughs> in the second season, though. Yeah. No, he last helped year, him. he did a lot. He, hel- he helped him a lot, too, in, this, in that season. So, nothing wrong with that pick. Uh, let's see what Derek, what do you got it to? <clears throat> well, I'm stealing your guys' thunder because my number two is probably your guys' number one, and that's the uh, 95 Nebraska Cornhuskers. <laughs> um, they averaged the 53 points per game, beat teams by an average of 38 points per game, beat Florida 62 to 24 in the national championship game. So, yeah, I've got um. They were a very dominant team. Yeah. I mean, it, it's when you look at that team and that season, 
you just you just knew they weren't going to lose. And then you watched the championship game. It was just brutal. And then it was the end of Nebraska. Right. And they were done. Never to be seen again. <laughs> Still to this day. Uh, and now, like, I don't even know, you know, being in the what's going to be the big 100 someday. Like, <laughs> is he ever going to win again? <laughs> uh, so we'll see. But, yeah, I mean, that one, that one's hard to argue. And I'm going to spoil alert. Your spoiler alert is I left them off on purpose. What? I thought you would <laughs> definitely put them number one. Yeah. Uh, the the one argument I will have for that team is I don't feel, even though they did play some teams that were ranked high or higher, I don't think they played a real tough schedule. Obviously, the championship game, they just dominated, which that says something for itself. But they also didn't play a very tough schedule throughout the year. I think they kind of like they came in the championship game healthy and rested and like because they were killing people by so much and they weren't playing hard teams. So, but I left them out on purpose. Like I easily could have them right there too. Uh, number one, Wes. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta agree with Derek. Um, I mean, Tommy Frazier had a good game, you know, statistically <laughs> 16 for 199 rushing, two touchdowns. He didn't really <laughs> throw the ball much. He threw for like 100 yards. But I love reading the caption on the touchdown run, on that memorable 75-yard touchdown run. Yeah. Frazier broke seven tackles in drag. <laughs> Two Florida defenders <laughs> several yards before shaking them off and going down and scoring the touchdown. Yeah. That run was stupid. I I thought I was watching you play like college football. <laughs> <laughs> like it was just dumb. That was it was uh still in my mind. I, I could I could watch it in my head. I don't need to watch a replay of it. I can see that run in my head. Tell me a quarterback that (laughs) ran the option better than Tommy Frazier. I don't know. There there wasn't a lot. uh, You know, what's his name from Colorado? Darren Hagan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Hagan. Hagan was good. Hagan ran it pretty well. The quarterback Um, for SMU when they had Dickerson and um, James, Greg James. Right, right. But – both of you watch his his freshman uh, when he played in the Orange Bowl against Florida State. Yeah. He was a true freshman. And you saw the talent and how developed he was, but, man, he made some bad – I mean, was... he literally – one play, he jumped up and threw the ball backwards. <laughs> and, it, they, I mean, Florida State scored a touchdown. Like, I mean, it's crazy, though. He could have won – he could have won four national championships. Could have. Well, they they weren't high enough ranked there, but he could have won three because well, they played sure, yeah. number two when they lost to Florida State the second time, right. and they lost by two points. <laughs> what was off topic here? What was the um, Notre Dame's uh, quarterback when they were running the option? Are you talking about McDougal? Was no, that- no, no. When they were good. Oh. Um, uh, I forgot his name. Like old Notre Dame or newer? No, it was like the eighty-eight, eighty-nine. Yeah. Well, so the eighty-eight when they well, they won the title. Yeah, but they played um Major Harris. They played West Virginia was Major Harris. They, they played West Virginia, right? I don't remember who their then, quarterback was. Um, so. It was what, Tony Rice. Tony oh, Rice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was. He ran the option good too. That team was pretty stacked. I think there was a lot of guys who ran the option well, but no, none of them ran it like Tommy Frazier, obviously. Right. Like, but so I, I mean, mean, yeah, who you had? I left them out on purpose though, because it's too obvious for me to pick a Nebraska team. Honestly, I almost put uh, the seventy-one team at number five just because I couldn't believe Johnny Rod. Yeah. You just got to give him some love, Nasty. right, for an older team. Oh yeah. Hey, they right, still play football back then. What do you got at one? The uh, 2001 Hurricanes. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what was it? They uh, 
averaged 42 points a game and only gave up 9.75. So right. went 12 and 0. Too many good players, too much on both sides of the ball. Um, like, yeah, I don't know how you do, don't have Miami at one or two. I mean, think about you talked about the corner of the DBs. Clinton Portis, Willis McGahee, Najee yeah, Davenport. Right. <laughs> it's dumb. <laughs> yeah. They could have ran the wishbone. With Dorsey even. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I my number one, again, I don't know how Wes had him so low in his top five, but I got the 2019 LSU team. Uh Burrow, Chase, you know, um, Jefferson Jefferson here here's the thing with that team not only did they dominate teams but they did it with one of the toughest schedules you'll ever see they beat seven seven top 10 teams nobody does that well if you listen to Danny Cannell he'll say it's because the FCC is <laughs> overranked but... well I don't care you show me <laughs> another team that once beat seven you know top 10 teams in their season and uh and so yeah and then obviously Joe Burrow dominated you got one of the best receiving cores you know that you'll see especially when you look at what they did after college right you know you look at them now um so I I, I just don't see a better team out there than that 2019 LSU. Um because I I I don't I believe the SEC at that time was definitely the most dominant conference by far. It wasn't it wasn't close. So I give it to Joe Cool. The new Joe Cool. So that was a that was a tough one because you know there's some teams that you guys mentioned that you know like Georgia <laughs> You know, I they were right there in like my top six or seven. You know, I had to make some some concessions. I made a concession for two thousand nine Bama just because I went back and I looked at their season and man, they like they got it done. You know, they they beat some teams that they might shouldn't have beat, especially by rankings. Uh, they had a lot of All Americans and things like that. So there's a few concessions I made, and then it was also hard to take teams off like um, Jameis Winston's Florida State team you know that i i considered that that scored the most pretty, points in college football history yeah. in a season you know i mean it's hard to leave a team like that off you know or you know georgia who goes undefeated for two straight seasons and wins the national championship game by the highest margin ever so there is there, there's a lot of teams that you you run into like I had you guys were just talking about it because I had the '88 Notre Dame on there because they won the national championship uh, in a the same thing as kind of like 2009 Bama is they uh, they played a really tough schedule to get there, you know, so they had a hard time getting there. Uh, but those are some of the teams. Any teams you guys left off that you think would be uh, honorable well, mention? Oh, man. <laughs> Let's see here. Now, I didn't put any Bama teams on. You could have gone with any yeah, of the Nick right. Saban Bama championships. 2020 Bama, even though it was that's a, the one I that's the one 2020. Yeah, God, they had a lot of good players in that team. I mean, they beat Ohio State pretty good. I yeah, think. hammered them, and they played a, a pretty pretty tough schedule that season, yeah. according to rankings. What about um? What about that Auburn team? Uh, Cam Newton, Auburn. Mm, that was more like Cam, it was Cam Newton. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I guess the same happened to Vince Young, right? So I took off yeah. the 2005 Texas team because it was just like all Vince Young. Yeah. But they played a good season and won the championship against a tough, broke a 38 game winning streak from USC when they won that game. USC have won 38 games in a row up to that game. And then you I like to mention a team championship. that didn't win a national championship, but because they got screwed, is the 93 Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Yeah. They beat. That team was good. 
they beat Florida State. Mm-hmm. And then they ended up with the same record as Florida State, but Florida State got the national championship. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was the well, who, I had somebody else on my list like that. Uh, was it 97 Michigan? And they had Charles yeah. Woodson. Mm-hmm. I was looking at some of their stats. They didn't allow like a second half touchdown for like their first eight games of the season or something like that. Their defense, like, <laughs> their defense was ridiculous. Yeah. So yeah, a lot, a lot of good teams out there. That was that was a fun one to to, to do. Um, so let's jump into our our next topic, which again equally is hard because when you again you're, we're talking about uh, best movies, right? We're switching over to HSC movies, and we're talking about best picture winners. So movies that won best picture Oscar, and then ranking them in the top five. I got to tell you, I had to mess with it because i pretty much could have just done the top five all from the 70s yeah it was it was tough in that sense uh because (laughs) there's some times and you know there's a couple older movies and we'll get into this we talk about but there was a couple older movies where i'm like man you're leaving that off because it's a great older movie but it's just not a great movie you know when I was looking in, like, the last 20 years, there haven't even been any good movies. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, so it's it, just, yeah. Forget about the last 20 years. Like, right. Done. Well, yeah. So so let's jump into it. HSC Podcast, top five Oscar-winning best picture movies. Uh, let's see. Let's go west. Derek, let us off. Last time, why don't you lead us off to your number five? Boy, this is tough. Oh, this man. This is real tough. I had to go with Braveheart. Got to go with Braveheart um, because after Braveheart, almost every movie tried to copy the speech before everyone died. <laughs> and nobody can do it better than Mel Gibson because when they saw him, they actually were like, dude, you're not William Wallace. He's like seven feet tall. And yeah. he made a joke. He actually made a joke about himself. And then he made the speech, and it wasn't that long, and it wasn't that old. Less is more when it comes to acting, yeah. and he just nailed it. One of the best movie scenes that you'll ever you ever see. And the ending is very hard to watch. It's hard for me to watch still. That's why I don't even really watch the movie because yeah. of the ending. But the whole um, Robert the Bruce becoming yeah. the leader, having the courage to say. Give his father say, you know what? I'm I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna believe in my people. After he uh, already screwed Bill Gibson over. Just, <laughs> I mean, Long Shanks is probably just I mean, just brutal. I mean, uh, just it's a good role. He throws his son out of the window. <laughs> I mean, come on. Survival of the fittest. That stuff nowadays. <laughs> what I thought he didn't, you know, he threw his son's lover out the window. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Uh yeah, that's a good, it's a real good number five. Uh Derek, what do you got at five? Well, it's one we talked about last week, and that's the 1992 winner, Unforgiven. Unforgiven, yeah. It, it's hard not to put, you know, one of your best, your top westerns there, you know, that won the picture and you hear it. So uh why why you got them at five? I just think it's a bit, like we discussed it before. It's just the whole, from beginning to end, the whole transformation where he was like, "No, man, I don't want to." You know, I I did a lot of horrible stuff. I'm I'm a good man now. I'm not doing all this. To okay, I'll help you out because it's for you know a good cause and whatever. To what happened? Okay, right. <laughs> now I'm going back to the way I was. <laughs> and, and that. The actors in it are just Oh, yeah. Amazing. Dean Hackman was so good in that movie. Yeah. Morgan Freeman, Lenny Eastwood. Like, he, he, it's a, a – that, that's like a, an NBA super team. It's yeah. like when you get three superstars. And so, yeah. And uh, I'll tell you, I think I had Unforgiven at six. So, that was that would be my honorable mention. I love that movie. 
but here's what's hard about this is because there's just so many good movies and you could go a lot of ways on here so my number five i got rain man I, dustin hoffman tom cruise i mean this movie there's a lot of lines from the movie you know that you remember but you're also like it's it's well done the story's great you know it keeps you it keeps me entertained throughout the whole movie you know i just i love watching i watch it i could watch it over and over again and and i really like that role for tom cruise but i think dustin hoffman is just i, I don't think anybody could play that role better than he did and so and i love that movie it's one of my favorites and camera sucks <laughs> Camera, yeah. <laughs> Camera sucks. Well, you know, a lot of people, it's funny you bring that up. A lot of people <laughs> just kind of forget that movie. Now. Oh, man. So good. Think about it. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, it, it, definitely. definitely. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's one of my favorites. So I got them at five. Just, just snuck in. Like I said, I probably took some other movies out for personal. Again, this is when you're talking about the best movies, right? Sometimes that little bit of personal touch comes in, and this is why I'd leave out a movie like Unforgiven over Rain Man because I just enjoy Rain Man a little bit more. So, number five, down to number four. Derek, what do you got at four? This is one because I just love this movie and I enjoy it so much. And I don't know if you can have a better one two punch than Paul Newman and Robert Redford. Oh, the sting. And that's 1973, the sting. Oh, I love the sting. Oh man. I, and you know how many people haven't seen the sting? Dude, they, they don't show that's we we're talking. I was gonna put that on the list last week because they do not have it on TV. I I not never anymore. They on, used to. They used to when we were kids. While. When we were kids, they played it a lot. Yeah. That but was, they, yeah stopped, right. they they stopped playing it. Huh. You can rent it on Prime for $3.79. Yeah. <clears throat> well, and then to go into the James Bond motif, the villain in this is Robert Shaw. Right. <laughs> who was the villain in uh, From Russia with Love. Uh, but it's, yeah, I mean, you tell, you, you say why it's so good, but I, I'll tell you why I think it's so good, but go ahead. Well, it's just, a, you know, it's about grifters and cat and mouse and like, you think it's going to happen one way, but they're like, "Oh, we we were planning this the whole way." Kind of a, uh, yeah, and just the way that like Paul Newman is like one of the coolest people out there, and then Robert Redford plays the really good like gullible, you know, trying to be as good as Paul Newman. It's just yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's got like it's got humor, you know. It's got it's there's a point where. It's got great acting. It's got a great storyline. Like all those things come together to make a great movie. And um, that's what I like about it. Like, and it's entertaining. It's so entertaining. You know, because some movies, I, I I mean, and I have them on my list. I have some movies that, you know, you, you're it's in there because it's just spectacular, you know. But then there's movies that are just good movies, you know, and it's about the acting, it's about the storyline, or it's about, you know, just the little things in it. So uh, I think the Sting is right there. The Sting you can watch every, I mean, that's one you can always watch. Yep. For. Yep. Yeah, I love it. Uh, at number four, uh, I got Silence of the Lambs here. And uh, for a couple of different reasons, but I mean, number one, obviously Anthony Hopkins. Like, <laughs> You can't, again, this is another, I guess I just like movies because I just said this about Rain Man. I don't think you could play, pick a better person <laughs> to play Hannibal Lecter than Anthony Hopkins. Like, he, he I really think he is Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> <laughs> like, this dude's out there eating people. Uh, but also, I think Jodie Foster does a good job, but the storyline is so good. Uh, it's And it's also not... It, it also it's that murder mystery thriller you know it gives you the other elements of a movie um that are great and so it's it's a it's just a well done overall movie and i think both uh foster and hopkins did a good job uh, but mostly i i got them there for anthony hopkins which he's not even he's not even the villain in this right yeah and but still like he he's still 
the guy, you know, like yeah. he's the guy you want to see. Yeah. And then that's what's interesting is uh, I didn't think they did a good job of keeping the villain involved in the movie when you have a big Anthony Hopkins playing this big Hannibal Lecter role. You, it still kept that other part interesting, though, you know, and the whole storyline. But yeah, he's not really the technically the villain. <laughs> Wes, what do you got it for? I got Forrest Gump. Yeah. Before. Because, like, we talk about how you can look at a best picture, best movie of the year. And it's sometimes the movie is actually just a picture. It's, a, it's just there are a multiple scenes put together and just this – the images tell a story, and I think it it it's done so well in Forrest Gump. It goes through the time frame, just in a way where it's just you can watch it. It's 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 just a beautiful film, and then you have the character itself as Tom Hanks plays. Yeah, and he does a brilliant job, and the supporting cast is great. Um, Lieutenant Dan is 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 like my favorite <laughs> of the movie. Um, Jenny's annoying, but you know what? You have to have Jenny in the movie. And, you know, I, I just, and Bubba, I mean, dude. Yeah, Bubba I love can't Bubba. Die. Bubba can't <laughs> die. And, and Sally Field plays a great little role. Yeah. Just, Sally Field did do a good job. It's, um, of course, it's not my favorite movie, but just looking objectively, um, for, I mean, think of the movie the last 30 years. I mean, right. what are we talking about here? For its time, um, I think it's a lot a movie that people can relate to. The only problem I have yeah. with Forrest Gump is it stopped the greatest movie of all time from getting best picture. Any other year, <laughs> it should have won. And and you could say it should have beat Forrest Gump too, but they're two completely different movies, and that happens so many times where the artsy more in the artsy film wins over you know, and that's just what it is. Well, don't don't leave the audience hanging. Well, Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, because <laughs> not everybody has seen all these movies. You got to remember. Yeah, um, but even yeah, Pulp, I mean, and Pulp Fiction was that year. Pulp yeah. Fiction. Pulp Fiction. I mean, it's I was really, thinking more Pulp Fiction. Um, it's but Shawshank, really hard. Yes. Uh, it's really hard to put anything over Shawshank, in my my opinion. But think about Forrest Gump, and I had him. I think I had Forrest Gump it, it, definitely in my top ten didn't make my top five the only reason it doesn't make my top five and again this is probably stupid to say because it's a movie and movies are not supposed to be real but it's just so unbelievable (laughs) that's the point you know um the dude ran across the country back and forth (laughs) you know like come on that you can't well the the book is even more unrealistic (laughs) but but, Although yeah. it's still such a great movie, and Tom Hanks obviously kills it, and again, I easily could put that in my top five as well. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, so that was your four. Uh, so we, we're at three now, right? Yep. <laughs> All right. So I'm leading off with three here, and again, this is kind of me geeking out a little bit, but I'm putting in Lord of the Rings: Return of the King here. And I could put either, all three of them, any of the three, I could mix these in and out. I think they're all three equally as good. But they didn't uh, all win. But they didn't all win, right? But like I said, I could easily switch them. In in my opinion, I think they could all be be right there. Because um, it's not just this one, but all of them. The way Jackson did this, it's so groundbreaking and mind-blowing. And just like, it's that's why I said it's spectacular when you watch it. Is there some good acting? Yeah, there's some good parts, you know. Uh, now I just lost his name while I was thinking about all these cool fight scenes. Uh, uh, Viggo Mortensen? Yeah, Viggo Mortensen. Yeah, he he plays Aragorn <laughs> so well, you know, that you know that he could easily, you could easily see the acting in, in the movie too. Um, and a lot of people did the same thing. And then there's a lot of great actors in these movies too, right? So now you're taking like, this huge huge production you're putting great actors in it and it's a good storyline like if you don't like that storyline like where what planet are you from <laughs> that you don't yeah. enjoy a good action adventure 
with some little hobbit trying to take a ring and throw it in a mountain. Like, come the on. End, the, the ending <laughs> is just brilliant. Yeah. It's just the ending itself. You're just like, don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it, man. And you're like, and you just want to throw and, something yeah. to the screen. Like, don't. But the, like I said, for me, this is more about more than just a movie about acting. It's about the cinematography. It's about everything yeah. they did. And the fight scenes are just amazing. And so it, it's, it, for me, it's groundbreaking and I have to have it in my top five. So that's number three. You ruined it all with The Hobbit. (laughs) Uh, Let's see. Wes, what do you got at three? I got Lawrence of Arabia. That was was close. I had it on my list. uh, I've watched this movie. I've probably watched the movie 50 times. And I watch it. I used to watch it because it just kind of like I can go to sleep sometimes. Because just the long desert scenes. Well, and it was on TV uh, 8 million times when we were kids. (laughs) Yeah. But watching it and actually watching, because I I always thought it was over the top. You know, Peter O'Toole is a great actor, but he's more of a theater actor. And, you know, he was an unknown when when he got cast for it. And I'm like, it's kind of over the top. But I realized they did it on purpose because they wanted to show. I mean, honestly, it should be required viewing in school. Yeah. They show how someone thinks he's God. And, you know, he 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 basically, you know, he takes over the, you know, takes over the military base and the people started worshiping him. He started believing in his own press. And he started walking around like with swords and making great speeches. And then he gets thrown in prison. And at all ends, he realizes, dude, I'm not a god, I'm a man. And he doesn't want any part of it anymore. He's like, you can't stop now. And it's like he got he got roped into it. And he's like, I don't want to be Lawrence of Arabia anymore. And it's a great, it's just, it's such a great movie as far as like watching a, a person that thinks that, oh yeah, I'm I'm, I'm so special, just kind of cave. And then he ends up yeah. dying in a motorcycle accident. I mean, it's um but Bummer. just the <laughs> cinematography, the cinematography for 1962. It's just the desert scene. That was good. That was really good. It's one of my favorite shot movies. Yeah. All right, Derek, what do you got at three? Uh, My three is my probably number one war movie. Oliver Stone classic, 1986. Yeah, God. I had a hard time taking Platoon off the list. I've seen Platoon I don't know how many times. Yeah, like uh, Willem Dafoe, Tom Berenger, Charlie Sheen. It's just, I, I mean, yeah, Oliver Stone just did such a great job with that movie. Yeah, and it was different. Oliver Stone because after that, of course, he does all these crazy movies, and he has no limitations. That he put limitations. This is going to be a war movie. We're not getting into the politics crap so much. It's going to be, this is, he he put limitations on it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was a hard one to take off for sure. Like, I was kept going back and forth with different movies. Well, there's better, I know, but I just, for me personally. Well, and yeah. then I, and then there's one, one I left off because I didn't want to be redundant, so... Yeah, yeah. I almost left that one off to not be redundant, but I couldn't. And I think you're talking about the same movie. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so that it, I, Platoon, though, yeah, I agree. Like, that was, that for me, when I started my list, like, Platoon was high, and you know, it's just um, there's a couple other movies I wanted to get in there. And again, it was more personal. So that, mm-hmm. that's what this comes down to, right? We're, we're given our top five. So, yep. Uh, so that was your two? Was that three? Two? That was your three. So now we're on two. So Wes leads us off here with two. I'm going to go with this movie called The Godfather, <laughs> which is the one Derek was just talking about, <laughs> right? <laughs> just, I, get, I got it. I, I got to put The Godfather. I mean, honestly. The series saying I, I like Godfather Part Two so much, but it's just 
it's Marlon Brando. May, yeah. I mean, you have to have Marlon Brando in The Godfather. It makes it better to me than the second, just because he's in it. He's the foundation of everything that happens in the movie and how Michael becomes who he is, uh, protecting the family. Um, Sonny makes the movie. Without Sonny, he's really good in the second one and the out clips. It's pretty hilarious. He went to college and got stupid. I mean, <laughs> classic lines. But yeah. the, Sonny's temper is epic. <laughs> he plays such a great role. And Robert Duvall, of course, is always Robert Duvall. Um, yeah, he's so solid. And the, the scene where, you know, he goes and asks the father for his daughter's hand, you know, in Italy. I mean, that was just money. I mean, kills the heads of the five family. I mean, just has everything. Yeah, well, and here's the thing. It's a perfect like, family movie. For all when you're talking about best picture and people are arguing whether Godfather 1 or Godfather 2 is number one. Like, you you already know, like, it's good, right? You're not arguing whether, you know, Godfather is better than some other movie. You're arguing if Godfather 1 or Godfather 2 is the best, best picture ever made, you know? And there's plenty of people out there that have Godfather 2 above Godfather 1, but then they have them at 1 and 2 or 1 and 3 or, yeah. you know, or they have Godfather acting. So it is like, it's hard not to put it on there. I, I think Derek went the route from his last comment of taking it off, which I almost went that route too, uh, because it's just too obvious, right? Sometimes it, it seems it's just too obvious, I think, but it's, it's just, it's an incredible movie. Uh, let's see, Derek, what do you got it to? Um, the 1943 classic Casablanca. Casablanca. You gotta love any movies Nazis in it. It's a, I mean, listen, we're gonna have a beautiful friend. I get this a making of a beautiful friendship, you know. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. it's it's, it's iconic. It's classic. It's Humphrey Bogart. I've seen that movie so many times. So good. Right. And there, you know, there's something about black and white too that makes a movie better. Uh, I don't know, maybe that's just my opinion, but I, I love that when, when you could see a, a good movie in black and white. And he gives up the love of his wife to win the yeah. war. Yeah. That's the, the ultimate sacrifice. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that's a it's one of those ones I was talking about earlier, where it's like it's these older movies. Like you also have movies like Gone with the Wind, and um, there's a couple other ones I was, and they're great movies, so they're well, well worthy of being on the list. Can't go wrong, with Casablanca. Well, I mean, my two is very anticlimactic. It's Godfather. So, I mean, I thought about putting Godfather 2 as well, uh, but I like the original, and it is the original, so I'm going to give the original credit for being the original. And uh, still, it, it, it was too hard for me to take off the list. I wanted to just because I thought, you know, this is so obvious, and we've talked about Godfather so many times. Do I, do I really need to put them on this list? And yes, yes, I do, because <laughs> it's the Godfather. Doesn't get much better than that. That's all right. Well, this is the the moment everybody's been waiting for. Number one, Derek, you're up. I think you were wrong though, Steve. My number one is The Godfather, mm -hmm. not Godfather Part Two. It's The Godfather. Okay. Oh, it's so you... yeah. The Godfather is, I think, like the best movie ever. Yeah. The family. Right? <laughs> I got the family. The family. <laughs> Two is really good, but and I love De Niro, but his scenes kind of slow that one down a little bit. It does, yeah. Where one, it just goes so well, and yeah, like James Con. Yeah, so good. Did Did you know that Coppola? Mm. He did. He wanted to do Apocalypse Now so bad, and they said no. You do Godfather first. That was his second choice. Right. Godfather, come on, crazy! Really, I guess I'll do the Godfather. And <laughs> yeah, th but there's a lot of things like that. 
to be honest with you, that could have not been a great movie. Like there's a lot of things that made that movie great because really it's just the storyline is super basic when you really think about it. They almost pulled Al Pacino in the beginning of the movie. They said, yeah. you know what? It's not working. He's not, he's, he doesn't feel comfortable in the role. They almost pulled him. Right. Well, oh, it's crazy. Me and Kaylin watched a show um, about the making of The Godfather. Not like a documentary. It was an actual like production show. And a lot of stuff you're like, oh man, yeah. It was so close so many times to not, yeah. not getting being made. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and like I said, it, it could have easily, even, at, even if it it could have still been made, but without the right cast, without the right director, without these little things, it's just some mobster movie, you know? <laughs> Which there's been thousands of those. Yeah. I well, mean, that was one of the things the mob was trying to not let him make it. Right. Too many, too many uh secrets coming out. <laughs> and then yeah, Sinatra tried to get him not to make it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, Frank, he uh you don't want to talk about his secret life. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, I thought you were re referencing him as you took him off, but you're like, nope, you got to put it on. Got to have the Godfather. Yeah, I had to take two off. Yeah. Um, so this one will throw you a little bit. And I think so Wes kind of overshadowed it slightly, but I got Braveheart here. And the reason I have Braveheart here is definitely for some of the, the reasons Wes already mentioned. But for me, the first of all, the story is great, right? This is about a country trying to gain their freedom from another oppressive country. And how do you do it? You have to have strong leaders stand up out of the, you know, uh, out of your um, basic average population right you know obviously the bruces could have done their thing but they didn't until you know william wallace does his thing they even backstab william wallace which is the whole reason he gets killed you know because of the bruces well in the and, movie not in real life it, no no I, I'm, sorry, I'm talking about the movie right and so that's why the movie and the storyline is so good because you know you 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 really it's really about the uprising of the population uh but it's also it's brutal in scenes it's hard to watch it's it's nice to watch with the, some of the, the the love scenes and the mist the romance stuff you know and then it's a little funny right like the, the you know i should have remembered the rocks you know when he nails the dude in the head with the rock which is like you know gets it going and and so there's all these great scenes that and it's it's long but it's not overly long it's entertaining the whole time and it's just it just it pulls you in all different directions so many different like ow you know great like you're happy you're sad you're you're scared like it's just it's crazy and i think mel gibson uh definitely pulls off his probably best performance ever so hey. yeah so I got Braveheart at one, and he, and it's underrated. He he didn't get the recognition for that performance right. that he should. Yeah. Have. Oh man, just yeah. The, I every, mean, the, every the part speech, the speech, he just nails it. Yeah, just completely nails that scene. Don't. All right, Wes, what do you got? Number <laughs> one, last one. Gone with the wind. Oh yeah. Gone with the wind. Frankly, Wes, I don't give a damn. Okay. <laughs> Frankly, my dad. They say that's the number one yeah. line <laughs> in the history of movies. movies Frankly, yeah. dear, I don't give a damn. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole point of the whole movie. Because at first, as a movie, I mean, it is a long movie. And I, I like it, the color, the restoration, because it shows how archaic that time was for the South. The South yeah. lived in a fantasy world. And Mr. <laughs> Red Butler, played by Clark, Clark Gable, who just <laughs> one of the best performances of all time by, by, by a male actor in a movie. He was the cool guy. He was the guy that was in it for the business. And he warned the South, you know what? You guys are talking all this stuff. You got your parties and your dresses and all this stuff. You guys can get your you know what whipped. And everyone got <laughs> pissed at him. I guess he was right. Yeah. The problem was he met a girl named Scarlett. Who he fell for, and it changed his whole life. And Scarlet, played by Vivian Lee, one of the great performances by a female actress 
the chemistry be between them is unbelievable. Um, the war scenes, and as his as he says, you know, you know, the South is going to lose. So you're going to fight gallantly, but you're going to lose. You saw them go through the poverty where they lost, and they had to fight for the the land. She has to come to real realization, you know, that she has to go out and actually work. She starts a business. Okay. It goes through the whole process. They get married. Two of her husbands, one of them, actually both of them die. And then Red Butler finally says, ask for his hand in marriage. They get married. They do great. And then they have tragedy. And, you know, at the end of the movie, he basically came to the full circle the way he was before. He's like, you know what? I don't want you anymore. And she's like, I don't understand, you know, I, I, don't you love me? And he's like, frankly, dear, I don't give a damn. <laughs> just like the beginning of the movie. Um, and just, it's, It is really one of the best movies ever made, right? 1939. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, if you beat out Wizard of Oz. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, no, I mean, when I look back, I, I think Casablanca and and Gone with the Wind, they were definitely both on my list. Um, and th there was a lot of good older movies that we left off that you could definitely put on there. There's a lot of good newer movies, except, you know, we were talking about this right at the beginning. Like, I could, I had a hard time picking one after, you know, like the year 20, 2005, you know. I, wa I wanted to pick The Departed. Yeah, The Departed's not just, just good. I, I, I couldn't, as a top five. Yeah, like, exactly. Like I enjoyed No problem. Country for Old Men, you know. I, I was thinking no, about that. No Country that for too, Old Men was but... good, but can I really put it in the top five? That was that was struggling. And a lot, and a lot of these, and the, the reason why I like some of these older epics is because the directors were brilliant because they would tell the story with pictures. Yeah, and they and there's things in it they they could tell the story without actually even saying anything. And I think Gone with the Wind sets you up like. Look, this is great, and, it, and they over embellish, and it's it's this um, they overact to emphasize a point that oh yeah, look how great their lives are. Yeah, they're gonna beat the North, and look what happens. Atlanta burns. Well, and everything you know falls apart, and it shows you the brut the brutality of war on our own soil, which a lot of films you know. Right, right. That's <laughs> helpful. It's helpful in these in those type of movies where they're any type of movie that's capturing events like that, they become they're more opt to become classics, timeless movies. Yeah. Um I, you know, like I think Patton is a movie that I look back at when I look at Patton and say, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it was George C. Scott playing Patton. It's yeah. Those it's, are times in history where you look at those things and go, wow, these these movies are gonna be timeless. They, they, and then they, you put the right people in them. And but when we're talking, we say best picture. Look at how movies. Maybe movies aren't as good as they were in a sense. But when you look at the writing, what's more realistic? Is it Red Butler or these guys talking the way they do? No, it's not. But the difference between Gone with Wind, like Patton, Patton's a, was written by Coppola. Coppola actually that was one of his first major things he wrote. This is how talented he was. Yeah. He wrote that. It was a great movie, but it was also, you know, kind of cliche the way it was, you know, was written. But that's the way movies were made back then. Yeah. That's what entertainment was. That's what you, that's how, that's how the audience responded to it. It wouldn't work nowadays. Not with this generation. Everything is precise, <laughs> technical. And, and, but, in some movies like Lawrence Arabia and Gone with the Wind, I think it benefited the movie to overact because it showed it it overemphasized a point of how you know how foolish these people were to believe, you know. Well movies, older movies too, they they not all of them, but a lot of them tended to be more uh realistic. They tended to be more about events. And things that were happening or did happen or are gonna happen, you know, it's not, you know, I mean, I guess some people will argue Lord of the Rings could have happened, <laughs> you know, I mean, but uh, realistically, from what we know, like it's not 
like a history based type movie, you know. It was um, hard for me to take Lord of the I was gonna put Lord of the Rings on. The only reason I did it is because you had the three movies. And I was looking at one movie, but even I didn't then, even think that was the best of the three. Oh yeah, no. It, I think you know, I think I think uh, it was the best of the three. The, second all, movie. the first I, I, one was awesome. It, I love the yeah, first. I but do the, enjoy the second one too. The I like third, Twin Towers. The third one, all the different scenes, how they put them together. Right, right. Was brilliant. Yeah. It's visually, the, I love watching the movie. The first yeah. one, I think, had a great story, and I love the story part of the first one. The second one, I love for the fight scenes and yeah. like the action in the second one. And then the third one is that like coming together of everything and you know finishing up the the story with some good fight scenes in it though too. The writing but, in the first one was my favorite. The writing, but the yeah. picture itself, my the third one's my favorite. Yeah. Here, so. Here's what I was saying at the beginning. We could just do a top five on the 70s. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Patton, The French Connection, The Godfather, The Sting, The Godfather Part Two, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Rocky, Annie Hall, The Deer Hunter, and Kramer versus Kramer. Right. Like, so Deer Hunter, hard time not putting it on there. Rocky, hard time not putting it on there. Um, yeah, it's crazy. I looked at that too. I was like, the '70s were wild <laughs> for best picture. There's a lot of good best pictures, and in a sense, I think, you know, I mean, these guys back in the '20s, we kind of look at that era and we watch the silent movies and all this stuff, and we're like, yeah, this is, this is kind of, you know, where's the, there's no sound, and I think that's the reason why you have best picture because back then it's just like. There wasn't a lot of, you know, there wasn't a lot of dialogue and, and sound and stuff like that. And I think they've kept that tradition also because you can play around a lot with best picture, but not best movie. Because all those movies Derek mentioned, those are like best movies. Yeah. But Hollywood can say, well, no, it's it's about more of the art, which I, I agree with that to a certain extent. But those movies, the 70 movies, those were best movies. Yeah. Those were legit well, movies. Every single one of those movies. Yeah, they were written, but they're just not. They don't look pretty. Like no, you know, Gone with the Wind, or you know, it, it's 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 just a I different can, category. I put any one of those seventy move seventies movies could potentially be in the top five for sure. Yeah, I don't even uh, remember the French Connection. I I I've only remembered the car scene. You know. But the, some of those uh, movies I have to watch again. It was, it's interesting, though, too, is we talked about this earlier, too. It's like when you get into those later movies, like, what do you get? Why do you think the later movies have no appeal? Well, like, why don't those appeal to us to say, well, this is one of the best movies ever made? Because they're more, they're not about the movies, they're about making a point. That's, that's probably, that's, that's got to be mostly it. it. And some of them are artsy, but it's actually more making a point. It's it's different now. It's like they're making a point, and that's really takes the artistic. Yeah, they're not telling yeah. a story. And it's not like then that. it's not as authentic as a right. as a great movie if it doesn't have the art like those mm. seventy movies you're talking about. A lot of those seventy movies they weren't very beautiful movies. That's why they didn't get the record. Like Taxi Driver. Like that is a dark movie and it isn't even well shot. It's grainy. And so nowadays they would look at that and, and sometimes some people would throw it in the trash. Well, it's grainy. It's like, but have you watched the movie? You know, it's 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 just a different, you know. The 70s were just yeah. dark. I don't I also don't enjoy, I guess, about the newer movies. I don't enjoy I don't think they take advantage of the technology that they have very well either. You know, I mean, if you got to, you got to think, and I haven't really looked into different technologies in a while, but you got to think at this point, technology, especially over the last 10 years has to be amazing in what you can do comparatively to even what you could do 20 years ago, 30 years ago, let alone a hundred years ago, you know, and I, and, I don't know. I mean, 
So maybe I don't see that in a lot of different movies. And what's funny about all those movies Derek mentioned, that one best picture, the one movie that Coppola, his dream project that he wanted to do, right? Completely the opposite of all those movies. And it didn't win best picture. It was up for best picture, but it was probably one of the most beautifully shot movies of all time. And that's why he wanted to do it. But it didn't win best picture. Because the year before, the Deer Hunter won. And I think Holly was like, we don't want to do two best pictures in a row <laughs> on Vietnam. Right, right. And I think that's the only reason it didn't win. So. Yeah, because then you got a courtroom drama, Kramer versus Kramer. Kramer stuff, versus, right. Which is a good movie, but it's not Apocalypse an Now. Yeah. yeah. I don't know <laughs> if I could put Kramer versus Kramer up there. Um, with all of them, you know, I mean, it's like it's it's not terrible, but no. um, <clears throat> I got one um, honorable mention, and it was mostly because the acting was so amazing, and that's on the waterfront. Yeah, it's been a while since I've seen that. Yeah, that was a it, it, that is interesting movie because it is really <laughs> just an acting movie. Um, I got. I had those Russell Crowe did a nice back to back thing when he yeah. did when he did Beautiful Mind and Gladiator. Back to back. I uh, like Gladiator. Pictures. Gladiator, it's just when you when you put it up against Braveheart, it's just not that so thing. I had to take off either Gladiator or Braveheart, and obviously yeah. Braveheart being my number one, I had to go with that. But Gladiator was really good. Was um good. I thought they did a good job with that one too. One also that gets flack because of Kevin Spacey, but American Beauty Man was amazing. Right. That was one that I really wanted to put on the top five, but it's just, I mean, for the last 25 years, it's one of the best movies, that's best pictures that's won because yeah. the acting's so great. And so it's do you want fries with that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dude, I mean, and you, I love Kevin Spacey in that movie too. Yeah. Like he does such a good job just. He, he plays the part, which unfortunately he maybe played it too well. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that's our that's our top five last uh, subject matter for the day. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Appreciate it. If you have any quick comments, what you want to hear some some top fives, we're happy to uh, to give those. Wes is wrapping up with The Godfather. So, yeah, if you haven't seen The Godfather, obviously our message is you better go watch it. <laughs> uh, some, some good top fives there, some good sports talk. <clears throat> Keep watching. Um, we're getting closer and closer to uh, NFL season. So we're going to start talking about uh, predictions and fantasy football drafts. Uh, you know, get, getting right back into that season. College football, we'll be hitting that. Uh, so we're just finishing out the summer here. And I got to tell you, man, it's, uh, the, the closer you get to football season, the happier I get. I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's it, it seems like it's going to be a crazy year. Yeah. There's going to be some stuff go down this year. AFC is going to be brutal. Brutal. Can't wait to see it, man. Can't wait to... Go through it. Go through our picks. Go through uh, predictions. This will be fun. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll we'll catch you next time.